Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, your Monday rundown of all the latest updates regarding SpaceX's Starship development, the latest and greatest launch news from around the world, and, of course, a preview of all the events to get ready for over the next seven days. So, without further ado, let us begin and talk about all the biggest and best news regarding SpaceX's Starship. <laughs> The week kicked off with a bang on Monday the 27th, where we finally at long last saw the commencement of Ship 20's testing campaign. Though there was a slight hiccup early on, a few heat shield tiles were thrown from the nose cone during venting of the liquid oxygen header tank. Unfazed by the TPS mishap, SpaceX pressed on with Ship 20 testing, with Tuesday seeing the first cryoproofing test for Ship 20, with seemingly successful results. A full cryoproof then took place the next day on Wednesday the 29th, again without any major hitches, and a confirmation tweet from Elon stating that all went well. With cryoproofing testing completed, the next major test in line for Ship 20 is a static fire of the vehicle's sea level and vacuum Raptor engines, and possibly in the case of the sea level engines, both using the main tanks and then again with the header tanks, which of course are the smaller tanks that sit both in between the liquid oxygen and methane tanks and at the top of the nose cone of the ship itself. It's these header tanks that supply the fuel needed for the landing burn. In case you're new around here, the reason that Starship uses separate tanks for the landing is because during the belly flop maneuver, all the fuel in the main tanks sloshes to the bottom and it would be very hard to pump it down to the engines in this state. But the fully fueled smaller tanks won't have this issue since they're still full, so they won't be disrupted during the belly flop phase of the descent. Falcon 9 never had this issue since it never flies horizontally like Starship does, so its fuel remains stable and is easy to pump down to the Merlin engines for the landing burn. Anyway, back to testing predictions for Ship 20. While the ship did pass the tests last week, SpaceX might want to repeat them a little bit further down the line after they make the necessary changes to the nose cone thermal tile system so that the tiles aren't blasted off during venting. So in addition to Ship 20's testing campaign, Booster 4 will of course also need to undergo ambient testing, cryoproofing and static fire testing as well. We've obviously never had a full Super Heavy complete with all 29 Raptor engines, so it's unclear exactly how SpaceX will approach static fire testing. Falcon Heavy had 27 Merlin engines, which were all fired together, though of course it's worth remembering that the Merlin engine is a lot smaller than Raptor, so SpaceX might want to gradually build up the amount of engines in the Super Heavy Static Fire campaign, beginning with maybe 3 and then 9 and building from there. We'll have to wait and see. Before this can happen though, Booster 4 will need to be placed back onto the orbital launch pad, since last week it was taken down in order to make room for SpaceX to install the gigantic Mechazilla catching arms, which will be used to catch a landing booster and a landing starship out of the air to remove the need for either vehicle to have heavy landing legs. We'll start to see the catching arms being used as early as the flight with Booster 5, though if I'm honest I'm not sure if I'm as optimistic as Elon is with seeing these catching arms being used so soon, but I would love to be proven wrong. But I get ahead of myself, we're still waiting for a date for the flight of Booster 4 and Ship 20. In order to perform the orbital launch, SpaceX will need approval from the Federal Aviation Administration, who at the moment have published a draft environmental assessment document, which the public can comment on until mid-October. Local residents and friends and partners of the show, Austin Barnard and C. Nunes Images, have already expressed their support of the launch. Unfortunately though, we have had some disappointing news. The FAA has decided to extend the public comment period all the way to November the 1st. This means that there will not be any chance of launch this month, and to be honest, probably not in November either. When the public comment period closes, SpaceX and the FAA will need to go through all the feedback they received and make any reviews and amendments necessary. It's not known how long this process would take. It could be days, but it could be months. And after this, SpaceX would then still need to apply for the launch license itself. So, to be honest, I think this is pretty much the final blow for anyone hoping to see a 2021 launch, and the Ship 20 Booster 4 flight will now almost certainly be in early 2022. Taking a look at Brendan Lewis's latest Starship production diagram, we can see that Booster 5 and Ship 21, which of course form the duo that will perform the next orbital flight after Ship 20 and Booster 4, are coming together at blistering speed. I imagine, given that Ship 21's components are pretty much all assembled, that we'll start seeing Ship 21 begin stacking either this week or next week. And then it's on to Ship 22 and Booster 6, which SpaceX are also working on. So lots of things to look forward to, but it is a bit disappointing that we're not going to be seeing a 
launch this year. But I think that covers it for Starship updates this week. Do you think I missed anything? If so, let me know in the comments down below. And hey, while you're down there, do make sure you like and subscribe to help support the show. I make these every single Monday to help you stay informed on all things Starship and of course everything else in the space industry. And speaking of that, let's take a look at everything else that happened in the space industry last week. <laughs> We had three orbital launches last week, including a couple of Chinese rockets and an Atlas V. Beginning with the latter, on Monday the 27th of September, United Launch Alliance launched another one of their workhorse Atlas V rockets. The primary payload of this mission was a Landsat 9 meteorology satellite for Earth observation, operated by NASA and the United States Geological Survey Agency. Also along for the ride were three CubeSats, one for technology demonstration, one for ultraviolet astronomy, and one for space weather monitoring. All four satellites are now operational in low Earth orbit, so a big congratulations to ULA for another successful launch. The same day as Atlas V, we had two orbital launches from China. One was a Long March 3BE, which carried a Cheyenne 10 technology demonstration satellite. The launch went well, but upon deployment, the spacecraft suffered a failure and the mission was lost. The intended destination for the satellite was geosynchronous Earth orbit, but given the failure, it's now stuck drifting in a geosynchronous transfer orbit instead. The other Chinese orbital launch last week was a Kwaizu 1A, which was a return to flight mission for the rocket. On board was a Jilin 1 GFN 02D Earth observation satellite launched on behalf of the Changguang Satellite Technology Corporation. Luckily, this launch was a bit more successful than the Long March 3BE, and the spacecraft remains operational. Anyway, those were all the orbital launches we saw last week, which wraps up this part of the video. However, there are lots of exciting things to look forward to over the next seven days, so let's talk about that now. This week's launches will kick off tomorrow on the 5th of October, where we'll see a Soyuz 2.1A launch from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. The rocket will be carrying a crew of three to the International Space Station, Commander and Cosmonaut Anton Shkaplerov, as well as two civilians, Russian actress Yulia Peresild and filmmaker Klim Shepenko. They'll be spending 12 days aboard the station to film about 40 minutes of footage for their upcoming film, entitled in English, The Challenge, and is about a cosmonaut who falls unconscious during a spaceflight and requires heart surgery in zero gravity to survive. The film will be released in 2022, and I'm certainly very interested to see how it'll turn out. You know, October really does seem to be the month to look forward to for crewed launches. Not only do we have a Soyuz mission this week, on the 12th of October, Blue Origin will launch a crewed new Shepard flight. On the 16th of October, China will launch a Long March 2F with crew on board. On the 30th, SpaceX and NASA will launch a crew on a Falcon 9. And Virgin Galactic are planning to launch some members of the Italian Air Force on Spaceship 2 on an as yet unconfirmed October date as well. Which means that, and please someone correct me if I've forgotten something, there is is great potential this month for every single operational crewed spacecraft to launch with crew to space over this month, which is going to be pretty amazing to see. Here's hoping they're all successful and there are no delays. Anyway, got slightly sidetracked there. The other launch to watch this week is the Eco Rocket. This brand new vehicle will be launching from the Black Sea launch site on behalf of Arca Space and is the first launch attempt of a Romanian launch vehicle. The payload is still yet to be confirmed. It'll probably just be a mass simulator to be honest, but I for one am really hoping this launch goes off successfully. The launch window for this will open on the 8th of October and last until the 12th. So there is a fairly good chance that it'll be flying this week. But that's the last launch of the week, which means that that's the end of this segment of the video. And I guess the video itself, other than me saying a big thank you all to making it this far into the video. Uh, if you want to follow me on social media, there's now a little panel somewhere on screen. And scrolling on the left of your screens, you can see a list of wonderful humans who support me on Patreon. If you want to sign up and join their magnificent ranks, you can do so by clicking the link in the description or via the card on screen. And if you want to join the channel directly through YouTube, you can do so and get a little badge next to your name in the comments and some ex exclusive emojis to spam in the comments. There's also two video suggestions for you on screen as well. And I think, what's the other one? Oh, it's the subscribe button, it's the circle.